Okay, and uh, again, now uh, I would like to tell about Laser Talk. What is it uh, for our Belgian public? Uh, because Laser Talk, uh, this is the program of Leonardo, and uh, it sounds like Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous, and uh, it was done specially to bring together scientists, artists, technicians and uh, humanists for to create some special environment and uh, fortify links between different interdisciplinary fields. And we uh, count to continue uh, to do laser talk Brussels at least five, six times a year. This one uh, is dedicated to the sound. So sounds that help us to listen, to learn. And uh, the subject is uh, about that uh, our world is sound and we um, interact with it every day. And signification gives a great possibility to present and analyze data. Space around us is filled with humming, murmuring, reverberation, carrying information. Sound waves can be meant means of can be means of diagnosing health condition and of monitoring the faraway space. Frequencies beyond human hearing can wake dormant instrument measuring volcanoes activity. Sound can be almost a physical instrument. Scientists and artists are exploring and probing the world by listening. Some artistic projects are researching how to make electromagnetic waves of light audible and purpose to enlarge our perception in a different, unusual way. Others are inventing new instruments using sound data. Astrophysicists refer to signification of light, brightness, variation to reconstruct stellar composition and structure. Today, our last talk uh, bring together uh, three persons, three wonderful, uh, two artists and one scientist. And I would like to uh, shortly introduce you to them. This is Arno Jacobs and uh, we have, uh, he is a, Belgium artist working primarily with the medium of sound. His work is both phenomenological and empirical, and it has its origin in a, in a, in a of sounds can trigger sonic processes that will affect and observe score of perception. His work focuses on a central question. How can the complexity richness and stratification of our direct daily environment be translated into something that can really be experienced. His work has been exhibited widely in Belgium and abroad. And in addition to his artistic practice, Jacobs co-directs with Christophe de Bourg Overton, a platform and production facility for sound, art based in the center of Brussels. I would like to introduce you another participant. This is Mathieu Zorstraten. He is also with us now, and uh, he is a trained architect who since 2013 embraces the path of visual art. In designing object, he moves away from the projection of the drawing and focuses on the experimentation of construction. He gives added value to his work symbolic and philosophical on the quality of the invisible and the relationship that created between the sender and receiver. He uses the code of craftsmanship to solve aesthetic issues often at the border of the unspeakable. Highly technical, Matthias Orstratum combines the ambiguity of material, a poetic thought made of humor and delicacy. He has since exhibition, exhibited in various events, galleries and festivals such as the Kick Festival or Ars Electronica 
of Venice Biennale. And uh, I would like to introduce our third panelist participant. She is just arriving. Sometimes uh, there is a train <laughs> real late, uh, so she is here. She is coming to the um, to the camera. But I would like already to introduce, uh, to give you information about her. She, this is Professor Katrin Kollenberg. She's an astronomer, astrophysicist. She is coordinator manager of SRO Belgium, European Space Education Research Office, coordinator at the Louvain uh, Catholic University. She is a professor of astrophysics at the University of Antwerp and uh, VLB. After obtaining her PhD in astrophysics at the Lowen University in 2002, she did research at the University of Vienna and the Harvard Smithsonian Center of Astrophysics. At each of these stops, art always featured alongside astronomy. Her scientific research is situated in the field of stellar astrophysics, in particular variable stars and as <coughs> astroseismology, the physics of vibrating stars. She is passionate about science and art, astronomy for development, and innovative artistic science communication and education worldwide. In this context, she long ago made the bridge from the data of vibration stars to the sound that can be associated with them, and discovered the, the uh, power of multisensory data exploration. Her collaboration with Wanda Diaz Merced, who uses and started sonification inspired her to start up fine tuning sonification techniques for pulsating stars. While star sounds have often been used for science, science communication. The power of the signification method for data analysis and astroseismology, and by extension other fields, has been thoroughly investigated. The astrosounds collaborate allows this to be investigated on a larger scale by letting the public listen to the stars. So this is uh, all our three panelists. Quite often uh, we have uh, our collaborator for laser talk. Unfortunately, she couldn't be with us today. I did do it because uh, because of COVID. So we live very strange time. So I would like to give a word to Arno Jacobs, and uh, he will first present his own work. Okay. Thank you. Everybody, um, I will first um, I will do a, a short presentation in two parts. Um, the first part is um, more about what sound means, what sound means to me, and the second part will be how I use sound in my uh, practice, and I will give give some examples. So. Um, First, uh, maybe to say, um, sound is important for me because um, when I discovered um, how I could use sound into my practice, I discovered uh, quite uh, soon that <coughs> sound um, travels in, in different ways uh, to, to ourselves. So, uh, you could say that um, sound travels through air, solids and liquids and because of this it's a quite peculiar uh, place uh, in the human spectrum of perception. 
Um, first, it allows uh, wave, timbre, and conductive perception of reality. So that means that um, the wave propagation of sound um, is normally like it would be through a speaker, it comes to you through air. Um, but there are different uh, aspects of this. Um, and first, for example, is that you can um, differentiate um, the physical properties of sound. So that means that you can also um, have an idea of the source of sound when you listen. Um, and because of this, this is linked, of course, uh, through memory um, <coughs> and also cultural differences. And um, <coughs> of course, there's also underwater sound, or um, if you listen underwater, um, this is a way that is quite different because you don't listen through the air, but uh, then you have the aspect of bone conduction. Um, and the sounds will travel through your body, uh, through the bones. Um, secondly, I think hear, hearing is a sense which allows uh, a three-dimensional um, way of perceiving um, without looking. So if you close your eyes, you have an idea about three dimensions. Um, and of course, the aspect of, um, of materials when you are in, an archi in architecture, um, <coughs> it gives also uh, something about uh, aspects of, of a space. If, if a space would be co completely naked or it would be uh, all hot materials, you will have an idea uh, without looking um, if you would listen um, attentively. And then third, there's a process of hearing that is a connecting of a connected mode of perception. Um, what I mean by that is um, you can listen and you can um, also look uh, and hear, for example. And this is a connecting mode, so that means that you uh, you listen in an uh, intelligent way, um, <coughs> but um, it gives additional information. So, for example, when you are um, outside, you have the wind blowing in your face, um, you have an idea about smell, um, but you have also an idea of velocity. Um, you have also an idea about how strong the wind would be. And of course, sound needs a listener, an interpreter, and uh, a transformation process between the propagated sound waves <coughs> and the listener that interprets the sound within a con cognitive process. So hearing can be a process of auscultation. Um, and I think we really hear through, or we, we think through our ears. <coughs> then we have the physical aspects of sounds. Um, when sound wave hits the eardrum, there's a process of transformation happening and there's also a process of translation. So as sounds move through air, uh, it never le leaves the listener untouched. You are always in a physical way um, listening, for example. So low frequency can be felt um, loud sounds can resonate for a long time um, into your head. You can have ringing effects, um, earworms. Um, so um, I think sound has a lot to do with pressure, 
pressure variations inside the ear and it displaces the inner organ. So, um, yeah, that's, that's all, all um, different aspects that shows that sound is a physical process. Okay, show a small video. Is there also sound? circular membrane which starts to vibrate when sound waves strike it the sound waves are passed on by the movement of the eardrum to the middle ear in the middle ear are three tiny bones referred to as the hammer the anvil and the stirrup collectively they are known as the acicular chain these form a bridge from the eardrum to the entrance of the inner ear their interaction increases and amplifies the sound vibrations further before these are relayed fully into the inner ear via the oval window. In the inner ear is the cochlea, which is similar in shape to a snail shell. It contains several membranous sections, which are filled with watery fluids. When the sound waves vibrate the oval window, the fluid begins to move, thus setting minute hair cells in motion. These hair cells then transform the vibrations into electrical impulses, which are sent via the auditory nerve and onto the brain. What we call noises are actually just sound waves, which are transmitted through the air. Signia. Life sounds brilliant. Our world is full of... So uh, I really like this video because it really gives a lot of ideas about how it really works inside your ear and it makes it more uh, palpable. <coughs> so um, if we look back at this video, uh, you could say that sound can be influenced at three stages. Um, the first stage would be um, at the origin of the signal um, and this is closely related to the, uh, the nature of sound um, and the second stage would be inside the ear um, where the detection happens uh, with the nervous system and then of course um, the listening process can be influenced in a way that's uh, things also other things can happen in an, in the inside your ears so you could have distortions or you can have uh, autoacoustic emissions that will influence and uh, how, how the sound comes to you and how you will interpret it and of course you have uh, tinnitus that will also add, uh, add a certain distortion into the, the way you will perceive the sound and then the final transformation into perception um, would be the cognitive part and that would uh, trigger your memory. So when you listen and you, um, you will also be influenced by the memory of the sounds. Um, and then a third aspect of sound that I think is interesting is uh, that sound is is an event. It is something that happens in time and it changes also in time. So it has a linear, complex, layered property and it evolves in time, both in contents and how we translate it. So you could say that sound always changes. It has a dynamic property, um, but sound is never passive on its own. It becomes passive when you don't pay attention to it. So time is a, an essential factor because it helps us understand sounds. 
and um, yeah, it's an element of the translation and how you understand it. So time is an important factor. <coughs> so yeah, that's the first part. And then um, I will present some installations. So in this installation you have um, four elements, you have a magnet, you have a coil, you have water and um, a balloon um, and all these elements together when you uh, put them together you can have um, uh, sound propagation um, and the sound propagation happens really because um, there's the balloon and in the balloon you have the air and so uh, it becomes a cavity uh, that functions as a speaker. So um, what is important in this installation is that it's kind of a deconstruction of, an, uh, of a speaker um, and with the same elements <coughs> I make uh, a different kind of speaker. Um, and 
this is just uh, an, uh, yeah, kind of a performance, very short performance of two minutes or something like this. Uh, and then uh, the installation runs uh, for, the, for the evening. This installation uses uh, light um, as a as a means to uh, to make sounds. It's based on a, on a principle um, found out by Graham Bell um, in his search to to make um, wireless transmissions. So in this installation, um, I use the same principle. Um, I use also light, um, but it's modern light, it's a laser um, and you have different wheels that are uh, rotating and uh, the, the, the speed of the rotation um, will, um, yeah, will change the sound and will um, give rhythms to sound but also different pitches uh, to sound. Um, and it's the light that is hitting uh, a material uh, that is um, and this there's a pho photoacoustic cell that I made myself uh, and this cells um, uh, exists uh, through uh, just air black material that is uh, black copper material um, and because of the the heat and uh, the light of uh, the laser, uh, this material will contract um, and this will form uh, a sound into the, um, into the horns. <coughs> Okay, so I just wanted to add also that I always use or mostly use technologies uh, and I deconstruct the technologies to, to make installations and uh, to work on, on aspects uh, to find new ways to, um, to make sounds or new ways to amplify sounds. Hmm. Thank you very much. No. Uh, I would like now to give the word to Katrin, okay. yes. and uh, she will tell you about her work and uh, about what she is uh, uh, doing, like astrophysicist, like uh, like working also with the sound, like working also with the public, with the wide public, mm -hmm. to give them possibility to uh, listen the sounds of the stars. Thank you. I sent my presentation. Did you download it? Sorry. Check it immediately. It's in, it's in by WeTransfer, so I sent a mail. Um, so, yeah, meanwhile, I'll, I'll already talk a little bit before my, my presentation was sent while I was on the train, my train was delayed. Um, but so I, I research stars and um, my stars, of course, they're far away. They're very far away. But what I study are sound waves inside of the stars. Uh, and in my presentation, I'll explain how we can actually perceive these sound waves because sound waves need a medium to get across. <laughs> Like here in, the, in this room, you can hear my voice because there is air and my vocal cords make the air molecules vibrate and that's how actually the pressure changes and this pressure change is passed through the air to your ears and that's then, then we get what you saw in the movie. Um, 
But in space, there is mostly vacuum. There is no, uh, not enough matter to transport these sound waves. So thank you. That's why. So, yeah, when you look up, up at the sky, you see many stars, and actually you can say that our universe is full of sound because many of these stars that you see in the night sky, they're actually ringing like giant bells. They're vibrating like giant musical instruments, but as I just explained, there's no medium to transport these sound waves all the way to the Earth because these stars are very far away and there's no medium. But what we do get is the light. And Light uh, is also a wave phenomenon, just like sound, but light, the medium for light, um, light doesn't need a medium, it can go through vacuum, and light, what we call light, is just a part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so we can see a small part of this with our human eyes. Uh, there are parts of the spectrum that we cannot see, but actually cosmic objects, including the Earth, um, are radiating in different wavelengths and this visible spectrum is what we see with our human eyes. Now light is a wave phenomenon just like sound is a wave phenomenon and in the example that Arnaud just gave actually you, you transform light into sound. I'm gonna do the same basically because what we get from the stars is the light but what is originally in the stars are sound waves and sound is a vibration eh? just like I just explained with my voice this vibration is passed on through the air to your ears. Um, and just like we cannot see any kind of light, we can just see part of this electromagnetic spectrum, we also cannot hear any sounds. We also have a limited range of sounds that we can hear. We can hear sounds with between 20 and 20,000 vibrations per second. And this 20,000 is very high because yesterday I did the experiment again to see how high uh, my own pitch goes. Uh, and of course, kids, they can go maybe up to 20,000, but as you get older, this, uh, this upper limit gets lower and lower. Uh, but that's what we can hear as humans. Now, uh, we know that other creatures use other ranges of these sound waves to communicate. Um, and if you just look at our life on Earth, eh? we use these sounds from 20 to 20,000 uh, vibrations per second. But of course, bats, for example, they listen uh, to sounds that are much higher and it's somehow related to the size. <laughs> the sound waves of, that are typical for an object uh, are somehow related to the size. And in that way, you can actually make a step also from from living beings to heavenly bodies and for example planets. Planets also have their sounds. You know the sound of an earthquake. Uh, try to... Yeah, this is, this is actually a Mars quake. The earthquake you might be familiar with, but we have also recorded sound waves on the surface of Mars. And these sound waves, uh, they're very typical of, of Mars, so they're different from the rumble of Earth. They teach us a lot about the composition of Mars. Uh, what was said before also, the sound tells you something of the, about the object that makes the sound. And in this way, from these Mars quakes that were recorded with the inside lander on Mars, we can learn about the sounds. But in this case, we are dealing with real sound waves because we can go to these surfaces of planets. But when we talk about stars, of course, we cannot go there. They're too hot and they're too far away. Uh, but stars also resonate with sound waves. And our favorite star, the sun, it's much bigger than our Earth, but it's just an average star. And the, the sun also has sound waves. Now, stars are much bigger and they also live much longer. They live typically millions to billions of years. And in some phases of these long star lives, stars can become a bit, bit unstable and then they can start vibrating. 
they start vibrating just like my vocal cords, but because they're much bigger, they vibrate much more slowly. Now, um, they vibrate actually too slowly for our human ears to hear them, and also the space between us and the stars is mostly empty. It's vacuum. So the sound waves, even though they are resonating inside the star, they cannot make it all the way to us. Yet we know that they're vibrating precisely because these sound waves inside the star, they have an effect on the light of the star. Because as the stars vibrate, they show contractions and expansions. And this has an effect on the total light output of the star. So for example, when the star, yeah, when the star gets, uh, when the star shrinks in its vibration, it gets brighter because it gets hotter. And when it expands again, it gets cooler and hence it gets dimmer. And so you have these periodic cycles of brightness of stars, which you can see through the visible light or the electromagnetic radiation. But it's actually just a messenger, this light, for the sound waves that are inside of the star. And this light we can record with cameras attached to telescopes or even sometimes with your eyes you can see some of the stars that are very slowly usually but they are vibrating over, with cycles over several days or months and from these light waves we can get back to the sound properties of the stars and so it turns out that different types of stars produce different kinds of sounds these sounds are very low for our human ears, yet we can read them through the light. And if we want to make them audible, we can convert these light variations, we call them light curves that we recorded, we can convert them back into sound. We look for the frequencies in, in the data, we turn them into sound and we speed them up. We speed them up typically by a factor of one million uh, which in, in sound means translating it by like 20 octaves uh, and then it lands in this audible range that we humans can hear and then we can listen to some stars. And one example uh, is sound of a star like our sun, sonified, and I'll let you hear it. So this is the sound of a, a star that vibrates, vibrates like our own sun, because you might not think about it, but our sun in itself is vibrating in hundreds of thousands or even millions of vibration modes simultaneously. You cannot see the sun shrink and expand like other stars do, but actually the surface is vibrating with sound. Now, other stars, we don't see like a disc, eh? like our sun is quite close, 150 million kilometers, we see it as a disc, but other stars are so far away that we cannot see them. And I give you a few more examples of some stars that you can see in the night sky, just like dots of light. For example, our own polar star, Polaris, uh, is famous because actually it's, it's in the, it's the, the extension of the, the axis of rotation of our Earth. So what, as Earth, rot Earth rotates, you can see all the other stars turn around Polaris. But actually there's nothing special about the star, yet it is special because it is, it's actually um, a pulsating star. And it's not just a pulsating star, Polaris is part of a triple system, but this, the biggest star in this system is Polaris A, and that is a star that is vibrating, and its sound is a following. And this is a star that vibrates with a period of four days. So every four days uh, it will get brighter and dimmer. And so if you visualize it, this is a bit exaggerated, but actually here you see the star shrink and expand. And that's what happens in the case of Polaris. Another visible example in the night sky is Beta Cephei. It's also called Alfirk. This is not so far from Polaris in the sky, and this is a totally different star. It's much hotter, it's also much younger, and it has another sound.
So again, what we do is we just take the light of the star, then we look what are the periodicities in there and we turn them back into sound. Another star in the northern sky is one of my favorites because I've been studying it for a long time. It's RR Lyrae. And this star, this is actually a picture of the star, but it's sped up. In reality, this vibration takes 12 hours. Uh, here it's just one second, so it's very fast. Uh, but its sound is also very particular. So now you've heard four examples of stars that really sound distinctly different. They all have a different timbre, a different sound color, which is defined by the, the composition of the star, the internal, um, the internal structure of the star. And that's why we do this kind of research. Stars, they, they live and they die, they go through cycles. And we, as astrophysicists, we want to really understand what, what what, is, what are the lives of stars? What is their evolution? What is the, the future of our own star, the sun? Because stars, as they live and then they die, they give the material that they've used and created back to the cosmos. They form new stars. So if we want to understand our own cosmos, we want to understand these stars. And actually through these sounds, we can do that. There's a whole orchestra of sounds, but of course they're, they're trapped inside the star. But you can sonify these stars and so this study that I've been doing for a while has uh, led me to actually explore what if we just use these sounds for data analysis what if we don't just study the light curves and do the analysis by staring at a screen uh, but what if we really use these sounds for more than just giving talks and and making it clear to the people what we're doing but what if we really use these sonified stars. Uh, if you do a sonification from a light curve, you have to make certain choices because you can sonify any kind of data in a million different ways. So what um, grew from this research and also from contacts with colleagues of mine who are working on sonification, for example, one of my colleagues, she is visually impaired. She cannot look at a screen or see the stars. She has to listen to the data. And there's many scientists who might really contribute more to the, to the field of astrophysics or any kind of field if we can do a multi-sensory exploration of the data rather than a purely or mostly visual one. So this, this is an announcement of experiments that we did at uh, the General Assembly of the International Astronomical Union to test how trained astrophysicists would react to the combination of image and sound. Because if you combine different senses, you actually get more out of the data. This is very convincing. Um, now, recently here in Flanders, we have a research project called AstroSound. AstroSounds, that is actually a citizen science project. And what the idea behind this project is, is we have sonified stars, like the ones that you just listened to. So these are data from AstroSounds. We've taken data from space missions or from ground-based uh, observatories and turned them into sound, making certain choices on how to sonify. And now we want to have as many people as possible listen to these stars and give us information about to what extent the human ear is capable of distinguishing between stars. You could hear that they all sound very different, but maybe even subtle differences you can hear. And so that's what we want to investigate with Astro Sounds. Uh, the project started um, uh, two years ago. We have done a lot of work in the back end, making decisions on how to sonify, but now actually we have sonified data that we want to um, have the public listen to. And here you see an, uh, an installation that was put up in the library of Leuven uh, for the past two months in January and February. It was there and you could go and listen to some of these sonified stars. You could take part in an experiment in which we already tried to get an idea on how well does the human ear work for this technique. Uh, and so this was also done in collaboration with Parcos. It's a project on participative and part participation and communication about science. So this project, because 
we we are actually trying to understand the, the, the technique of sonification, but at the same time, um, it offers a lot of opportunity to do science communication because you can teach about stars, about the human ear, you can teach about, um, uh, yeah, we also work together with artists from the Lucas School of Arts who designed some small trailers for the project to attract people to take part. So there's a lot of extra, uh, extra that's come with this. We can do education and at the same time we get the data that we need in order to really uh, show the validity of this technique of sonification. And to end with, uh, as we are doing our astrosound research, we actually come across a lot of questions that we hadn't thought of before, because the team that we have now consists of astrophysicists, uh, also um, uh, some Several artists, people have been involved, artists, to, to look at how will we visualize this, how can we attract people to, to actually take part. Uh, but we notice that we really need to study human perception and we also need to study even the language that is used to describe sounds. Because some of these sounds, you hear that they're very different, but uh, how would you describe them? And often language is lacking there. So we have currently a survey in which you can listen to some of these star sounds and try to describe them. Uh, and if you want to take it, you're very welcome to do so because that will enrich us in our, in our uh, project to, to be able to, to communicate better about the sounds of the stars. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so now uh, this is our... Another panelist, such as it is Matteo Zostratton. He will uh, now present uh, his work. He will do introduction what he is doing like an artist and uh, also to show what he is happening between his object that more or less in the between of the science and art fields. So good evening everybody. Um, my work is mainly visual so I've skipped the complex exercises both of my friends just did now and I've prepared a small movie of seven minute movie and um, I will try to find it. My name is Mathieu. artist and architect from Belgium. I have quite a diverse practice ranging from building art installations to making games or kinetic artwork. I'm attracted to things I have no idea how to build and make. It's actually a trick to constantly stimulate my brain. Here is a quick selection of some projects. Rhizome. Rhizome is an interactive installation exploring the theme of memory. The installation consists of a cabinet topped with a vintage projector who constantly diffuses a random holiday film captured in the 60s. The installation is activated by a motion sensor that initiates all the devices. As the visitors surround the installation, a camera analyzes their gestures and their movement. When it detects someone is holding a camera or a phone, an abrasive mechanism is activated and the physical support of the imagery starts to being damaged. The information presented on the film gradually disappears from its original support, but is now transferred to the digital memory of the viewer's recording tools, which in turn can be used for a new narration or the sharing on social networks in order to make this memory survive. The installation can be seen as a discrete and intimate device which addresses the theme of transmission, memory, forgetfulness and the contemporary ways to transmit and engrave a moment.
Particles. Particles is an interactive data sonification device composed of an automated one-string guitar driven by the invisible. Okay, okay, it's actually driven by the analysis of the amount of CO2 gases and thus particles, thin and ultra-thin particles containing the air surrounding the installation. So how does it work? Sensors continuously collect the data from the direct surroundings. Every 20 to 40 seconds, a program converts the information, allowing a microcontroller to shift a mobile track that has the ability to slide along a guitar string. The program also controls an electromagnet who strikes the strings at the end of the fret's movement. Installation was developed in order to bring awareness to the invisible and sometimes harmful particles contained in the air. The device is connected to a guitar amp and the sonification is intimately linked to the context where it is displayed. Margaret. Margaret is a critical work about what we still clumsily call AI and the importance of the data used to train the neural network. Margaret was fictionally conceived in order to become an emotional talking companion of a lonely human. The human vanished one day. She then decided to create her own emotional support companion. This neural network was fed and trained with five or six important books. Since Margaret's goal is to create life, all the books she was fed and trained are about the meaning of life in general. One of those texts is actually the meaning of life, which is actually the script of one of Monty Python's movies. It's a bit of an easter egg but it points to the fact that an AI struggles detecting an ironic content or a scientific one. The quotes related to this content are often pretty hilarious. The installation features an artificial plant on a moving platform, asking questions about life, biological, metaphysical, societal. Margaret decodes the questions in real time and answers them by tapping on the resources of its database in order to educate the plant, so that it too can become an emotional support plant. The bottom line of the installation is to question the current status of AI, evoke the possible ability of a neural network to express human-like emotions, like loneliness, and furthermore, a human psychiatric disorder like schizophrenia. As in the bottom end, she's the only one making the questions and answers, and controlling the whole scene. Go, psyche old man. Go, psyche girl. Go, psyche man. Let us go. We've been fighting for these places for years. We've even voted. What do we do now? We've lost. No, no. We survived. What do we do now? We've cheated them. Homeostasie électromagnétique. It's an older work, and the origin of the work we'll discuss tonight. It consists of a double kinetic structure featuring a device similar to that of the metronome, whose main axis is extended by a free pendulum sheltering a sound column. The device evolves at the rate of the K index data provided by two remote observatories, one Canadian, one Belgian, and illustrates the cycle of a solar stove also called Oroha Borealis. Sounds and movement evolve gradually through a 20-minute sequence. In the climax of the period, the rhythmic disturbances are accentuated. The structure becomes unstable, the sound is accentuated, and the system tries to maintain its fragile equilibrium. Kewit is the work we'll explore a little deeper tonight. It's a sound and visual installation consisting of a connected device that simulates the light phenomena. As the colored veils present in the night sky at the poles during a strong geomagnetic activity. More commonly called polar auroras or northern or southern lights, the installation is fed with scientific data coming from 13 observatories spread around the globe a rate of one day per second and with information evolving from 1932 to the present day. On an ecological and 
educational level, the installation allows the public to visually see and interpret evolution and the impact of solar winds received by our planet during the last century. It also allows to see the evolution of solar cycles. The geomagnetic activity being essentially influenced by the solar activity. The visualization is completely analog. A unique effect is mechanically obtained with laser, sound and a custom UV reactive solution. The sound and the visuals emitted are directly connected to the data. The mechanical interpretation of the data offer the advantage of creating an organic and natural-like simulation. The installation is a great catalyst to evoke natural climatic changes through the last century. Sorry for skipping the live exercise for this part. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you very much for all of you. And uh, now I'd like to uh, ask some questions for start our discussion. And uh, making seemingly silent things audible to learn from them is the core of all your work and uh, this work that we will discuss with Matthew. He already we have seen this uh, wonderful image. And uh, you all do this by using some different of, uh, kind of translation of seemingly silent. Arnaud and Matthew approach the audible from the uh, more artistic point of view and Kathleen is mostly scientific, but also very artistic, I think. And so, Arno, you state that your work revolves around the central question, how the complexity, richness, and stratification of our direct daily environment can be translated in something that can really be experienced. Mutation in the sense of transition, of trans transformation, is an important keyword. Is, it your, um, is your installation heliophone, uh, you walk, um, the, the fact that there is no sound in the space and you turn sunlight into sound, can you explain on this and especially around this notion of really experiencing? Um, <clears throat> yes, um, maybe first uh, explain what is this installation about? Um, <coughs> so it's based on the, um, on the photophone. So it's based on the photophone, uh, which I explained earlier. So it's an, the idea that um, sound can be used, um, <coughs> uh, light can be used to, uh, to make sound. Um, and this installation um, is typically placed on, on a roof um, where there's a lot of sun. Sorry, uh, and here this is. Mm -hmm. 
So normally what, what happens is that this uh, installation is placed outside, you have sometimes clouds and then the sound disappears um, um, and it just the, this, um, the frequency of the sound will change according to uh, certain aspects of the, uh, of the intensity of light and um, for me it was um, a step further uh, from Photophone because Photophone was just an installation that used uh, a light that was conceived uh, by, my, by me uh, but I was interested in uh, using a light that, uh, that is really important to us and also um, a light that we can feel uh, so uh, in that way for me it's also a physical uh, installation because when you when you are with the installation you of course you hear the sound but you have the combination of the of the heat of the sun and um, somehow it's uh, a combination like I said um, like sound is um, can be something that you add uh, into an experience um, and in this way this installation is also that way so the installation basically follows the sun uh, all day um, and uh, according to the position the ideal position of the sun uh, the, the installation follows uh, the sun Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, next question to Katrin. Your field of exper expertise is the daily environment of the stars. On the website of AstroSound, there is a poet quote of the Sans Egupery, Little Prince. I love listening to the stars at night. It's like listening to five million little stars. Only as we have just observed through the work of Arnaud, there is no sound in space and it's a vacuum. Your work evolves on making stars audible. How do you do this and what is your goal? Is how far in this real sound of the star? I, you explained a little bit exactly. already before. Yes. So, but maybe you will add something just how you're working with the experience uh, with the people, how they are learning, how you uh, propose them to uh, listen, maybe just more details about yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, indeed, what we, what we take is the light eh, because there is no sound. The, the quote from Saint Exupéry. It is. Uh, it's. It's. It's not really what you can do. But of course, if you if you watch the stars, you can think that you hear things. But uh, what we do is we we take the light from the star and we turn it into sound, and that's what we uh, present to the public. And so, how do we do that? Usually, uh, the stars that 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 uh, the most of the data that we're sonifying are actually coming from satellite missions now, because since a bit over a decade, we have some telescopes up in space that follow stars non-stop sometimes, and that's much more practical than being bound to Earth and having the day-night rhythm, having the clouds that block the sun and the stars. Uh, so we use this very precise data, and since we have this space data, we actually found that for these pulsating stars, not all stars pulsate, but many pulsate in some phases of their lives, that uh, we find many, many content, many, many, many different frequencies, many different ways of vibrations, some that we didn't find uh, from the ground yet. So that has meant a revolution in our field. And so these are the data that we are now using for sonification. So what we do is take the data, do an analysis of the light data, then usually you find tens of frequencies and each one of these, each one of these frequencies, they correspond to a certain oscillation mode of the star, a way in which the star is vibrating. It's either expanding or contracting or it's moving, it's changing its shape a little bit. And we can actually mathematically describe all of these pulsation modes and they correspond to specific 
tones in the star. And then we make the choice, which one are, are we gonna take? Because which ones make the characteristic sound, the timbre of this star? So we've done experiments to see, should we take 20 or 30? If you take 20, is it enough to really distinguish this star from another type of star? Because just like you have musical instruments in an orchestra, you have different types of stars. And so the work that we have done behind the scenes is to identify what frequencies do we take. And then we now have these sonified stars. And now what we are doing in, by bringing them to the public is we, we want to make it also an educational experience. So we teach uh, the people who are interested about, for example, the pitch the pitch of a star, how high or how low it sounds, uh, is, is uh, somehow related also to the, the density of the star, which is linked to the size of the star. So in that sense, we can learn a bit about the astronomy, the astrophysics behind it. And at the same time, we have people listen to stars that have different pitches, that have different main frequencies. And what we find is interesting because it turns out that not all people hear uh, pitch in the same way because stars never or barely ever pulsate in just one mode there's many modes simultaneously these are contributing to the timbre of the star and then it gets really interesting when you can see how or you can observe how different people react to the star sounds does that answer the question yes perfect thank you, thank you very much and uh, Another question to Matteo. Your work equally has an instructive uh, and educational aspect. You develop uh, interested kinetic, kinetic machines and in a work under development try to recreate the sound of waves. The installation Kiyoit, which refers to the name given in Eskimo language to the glittering aurora, during the period preceding the appearances of the daylight, uh, the public can visually see and interpret evolution in the impact of solar winds received by Earth during the last century. It also allows to see the evolution of the solar cycle every 11, 14 years. Can you explain a little bit how this work and also maybe uh, tell your experiences um, with uh, uh, working with the uh, scientist because you told me that uh, for to create this work you connected uh, scientists who are working with electromagnetic wave and uh, have all this collection during uh, all this 20th century how you uh, develop this uh, relationship and work okay so I actually didn't properly uh, work with a scientist. I just uh, received most of uh, the information about the solar cycles uh, from Potsdam Institute in Germany. Um, I can, of course, explain how it, the installation mechanically works. Um, but for the scientific part, I think uh, Catherine would be well more accurate. But I'll give it a try. Um, amongst other values, uh, the main value that runs the installation is the KP index. Uh, KP index was introduced in 1949 by Barkels um, and was designed to measure the solar radiation uh, that is emitted by the sun. Um, the P in KP index uh, refers to planetary. Uh, and it's actually the sum of uh, the K index coming from 13 different observatories uh, spread around the world and that are um, um, reunited in Potsdam Institute. Um, experts have observed that indeed there are uh, certain cycles um, that occur every 11 to 14 years. Um, during each cycle, the sun stormy behavior is uh, goes to a, a form of a climax and at this climax the magnetic field of the sun reverses then it goes down again and you start another cycle slowly going up then you have a major storm uh, those storms are uh, at the origin of the um, are intimately linked to the polar auroras the ones at least the ones we see uh, on earth um, 
and actually this uh, data, the KP index, is the major uh, data that controls the intensity of all the mechanism of the, of the installation. So you can clearly see a relation between these cycles and, uh, and uh, the visual effects that is transmitted through the installation. Well, thank you very much, uh, because the, you told me also that you showed this uh, installation to one of the scientists yeah. uh, who is working with more or less like with the aurora, or just knowing, uh, just uh, and he told you that your installation is quite precise uh, in uh, <laughs> bringing uh, the visualization what is happening really, just like still. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, if there is some question, maybe from our auditorium for, to our panelist. Um, yes, maybe a question about the certification of, of stars, because it was... Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm a little bit more details, actually. Because you said there are several modes. Uh, mm -hmm. are, are they kind of root modes or non-root modes? And mm -hmm. I can speak louder. <laughs> <laughs> this one is not. Is maybe this one is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No. So, so my question was, uh, what what kind of modes do you do you discover in stars? Mm -hmm. Do you discover harmonic modes or, or non-harmonic modes, yeah. like in bells? Yeah. Uh, uh, that's the first question. Thank you. Yeah, it's a very good question. Because indeed, um, musical instruments have their own modes. Actually, every object has its favorite modes to vibrate in. We call that uh, eigenfrequencies. Mm -hmm. uh, and for musical instruments, they are made such that, uh, that they are harmonic in the sense that and the, the harmony, it, it is actually mathematically uh, very elegant because what we as humans per perceive as harmonious uh, comes down to integer ratios of certain frequencies. Um, now some stars do, s do show that uh, but in most stars because they are not as nicely built as say an organ pipe or a bell or a string in a violin which is very uniform in its thickness, in its, its density for stars, that not, that's not the case, because a star is a giant sphere of gas, which is much more dense in the center than at the surface. So you have a density profile. And in that sense, uh, the sounds are generally not going to be harmonious. Um, what you have in musical instruments are, are vibration modes, like a string, it's in one dimension. If you look at a, a drum, it's in two dimensions. In stars, it's in three dimensions. But actually, it's, it's the same kind of physics that you have there. Uh, so you can describe them mathematically. But if you look at the frequencies, it's rare that you see them in what we say as harmonious, that you have these yeah. integer ratios. Uh, uh, but sometimes you do. I was kind of expecting this, yeah. this answer. But actually, when you made us listening, listen to, to stars, mm -hmm. uh, basically, it, they were all kind of harmonic. So Some how did you choose <laughs> and why did you actually remove this inharmonicity yeah. in the modes? Some of them do sound a bit har harmonious actually because I chose some examples that really have, if you look at the, the sound wave <laughs> the, uh, and what we see as the light, light curve, it is, uh, for some of these stars, it is very repetitive. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the, uh, yeah, what the, the light variation, uh, if you would see it as a sound wave, it would really resemble, for example, the, the, the pressure waves that you would cause with, with a violin, uh, which are also like these sawtooth functions. Uh, so in that sense, for these stars, you do see some harmonious relationships because they are vibrating very fast, hence they have nonlinear behavior in their vibrations, and hence you get these peaked light curves uh, which actually sound a bit like a musical instrument of human production, <laughs> human creation. Uh, but then other stars like the sun, you have 
thousands or hundreds of thousands of modes simultaneously, of which we sonified maybe just 20, uh, and that's uh, really a random mix to the, to the ear. There are some patterns in it, but it doesn't sound harmonious. But tonight I, I gave some examples that are really very repetitive, maybe with some modulation on it, so it does sound a bit harmonious. Because you have only one generation of signal on the right. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. on, on there, and from there, because at some point you said you were speeding up, but I understand now that you do some kind of Fourier analysis, and then you 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 get you get the peaks, and you decide to use certain peaks to to synthesize. Yeah, so? yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So the light curve, we do a Fourier analysis of the light, so you get several peaks. We take the highest ones. We select among the highest ones in intensity. Yeah. So the ones that are most prominent in the signal, those we we sonify. And um, then you have to choose a basic frequency because yeah. there's it's uh, no usually yeah it is in some cases it's hard to pick the one that is basic because we determine our factor of uh, speeding yes. <laughs> of, of a, yeah of a multiplication factor it is determined by what is the basic frequency uh, and uh, for most stars you have like a prominent main mode but for many you don't so then you have to make a choice so it's not the same factor for each star no it's not the same so factor so for each star. Would that be yeah. To have the same factor for uh, well, we try to. It's basically because what we do is the stars they pulsate uh, with periods between minutes and centuries. So it's a very broad range, and we need to bring that into the audible range. So that is very limited, uh, and therefore we have some kind of function that makes this mapping from the star range to the audible range. Uh, which is why we don't always use the same factor, but we make sure that we can hear everything the star is doing. So it's uh, it's it's not arbitrary, but we made choices. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question, maybe a short question. Um, and who makes the choices? Uh, on based <laughs> on, uh, I, I was interested in knowing. Um, yeah, is it based on, on musicology then, the, mm -hmm. the choices that are made, or is it um, yeah, on personal favors? <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually this is something that, that when we were working in the back, on, back end of Astro Sound that we, that we had to, comp yeah, we were grappling with because we have to make some choices and uh, who makes it is it's basically uh, in consensus, so we we uh, first started just to, to find the frequencies. Eh? You have the light and then you find what are the, what's the most important frequency, com frequency content. You bring it to the audible range. And then you have to decide, okay, this star vibrates mostly faster than the other one, so it has to sound higher. Okay, so that, that's already, so we have some constraints, but then uh, the decisions on how many to take, it's then, based on doing different sonifications with different numbers and then seeing, okay, from when onwards does it not make a big difference anymore mm. to our ears, our human ears, to take 25 or 50. Um, but it, it does make a difference. So uh, we want to make the sonification usable for human ears and that's why we, we can probably cut off at some point to hear differences between certain stars. Mm -hmm. But it is, uh, it's been a, a part that has <laughs> involved many choices mm -hmm. to make mm -hmm. uh, that are not so easy to make. Mm -hmm. yeah, because there's also the perception factor. Exactly. Yeah, I worked a little bit on the Vera algorithm to actually uh, identify the peaks depending on how, how much mm -hmm. they would be, sorry. How much they would be hurt by the human ear. Yeah. Uh, and also taking into account the masking effects of, of some frequencies. And you might also have that, actually, that some modes are quite close and one masks the other. Exactly, yeah. So you try to go around this or you... We are, um, we are now <laughs> discovering this, <laughs> basically. 
Can you hear me? No. <laughs> yeah, so all these, uh, these masking effects or the perception. Um, excuse me, this is something that we are now figuring out. And so <coughs> you can probably go, you can probably go very far in this simplification, but the main question is, can we use it for classification of stars? Because that's, that's the main purpose, actually. That's the initial purpose. And then maybe if you are, for example, in, within one class of stars, every star is different, just like every musical instrument or every voice. Um, so then you could go, OK, within this class, can I hear the subtle differences? But for classification, the choices that we've made are sufficient. But then if you want to go listen to very small differences, then you might have to make other choices. And indeed, the, the perception, that's something where we now notice we have to do perception experiments. Because, uh, yeah, there's <coughs> questions like, the, what, what does the human uh, attention pick up? Eh? Uh, salience and things like that. So we are actually writing a proposal now to do these kind of experiments as a follow-up to what we're doing in astroscience. Yeah, there's a lot more to do. Thank you. Somebody have a question? It's also about the, um, the star sound. Um, is there any um, sound wave interference? Because if a lot of stars are making the vibration, there must be some uh, yeah. interference among the stars. Yeah. Can that be detected uh, through the change of the light? Or? Thank you. Yeah, in some cases, yes. The thing is that the, the sound waves are trapped inside the stars. And so, and the stars are, us usually they're far apart um, uh, because there's vacuum between them. So there is no contamination between the different sounds of the stars. But of course, if you have multiple stars in an image, which you often have because they're aligned in the sky, then you will pick up the signals from more than one star. Uh, so that's when you get some interference and you have to figure out what comes from which star. Uh, and also sometimes, actually a lot of stars are not born alone. About half of the stars are in binary systems, so they are, there are two or even more stars, and they also influence each other. So in some cases, the sounds of one star might even be triggered by the, by the proximity of another star. Uh, it's like plucking a string, but it's actually the gravity of another star that is plucking the one star to, to get this, these vibration modes excited, to start vibrating in its eigenfrequencies. So there, there is some contamination. But generally, if you can focus your telescope at one star, you will pick up mostly uh, the vibrations from that one star. I think that's very interesting. Another question? Somebody have a question? No? I... <laughs> Maybe just one last. When you have the sun, actually, it's a circle, as you said, the difference uh, between the sun and the other stars that are so far away that it's just a point. Do you do something about the surface, actually? And, and I know there are satellites who are monitoring the, the, the sun. Uh, and I guess some modes spread differently on the surface. And do you make some analysis that is uh, um, more precise than just the global uh, uh, light level, but also the, the way it fluctuates on the yeah. surface? Yeah, thank you very much. And Thanks to this, actually, we know that the sun has uh, hundreds of thousands of modes. Because if you would just look at the sun as a yeah as a disk and integrate the light of the disk, we would not see all of that. Um, we we would see much less modes than we see because now we can resolve the solar surface. And what we do actually is then we look at velocities on the surface. You can detect the Doppler effect, uh, the redshift or the blue shift on the surface of the sun. And you can see that different parts of the surface are moving in opposite directions. And this is, these are these vibration modes. And in this way, we reconstruct the motions, mostly based on what we see on the surface of the sun. So we really make use of the fact that we see the sun as a disk for the seismology of the sun, the helioseismology 
which is much more advanced and precise because we have the sun so nearby. Uh, but thanks to the fact that we see things in the sun and then we see similar things in other stars, we can say, okay, this star acts like, like our sun is acting with the vibrations. Uh, but for other stars, we cannot do that yet. So you can make a much more complex certification for the sun. Yes, yeah. And what I, uh, what I did was, was a simple one. <laughs> Yeah, which is enough to say, okay, this is a solar-like star, uh, but not to say, okay, this is the sun. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Uh, are there people certificating uh, planets as well, like in our own solar system? Yeah, I yeah. would love to hear how it works. Like yes, sense. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, you have sonifications of uh, several several uh, planets so the two that you heard were the earth actually we didn't listen to the earth but that's an earthquake and then you had Mars there we landed on the surface and we could record the sounds directly because we were on the medium itself but then you also have sound waves uh, that are around Jupiter around Saturn because we have missions around these planets and then what we could do is we turn the electromagnetic radiation that we measure there into sound. So there are sonifications of this that sound very spooky. So you can Google uh, spooky sounds NASA and then you will land on a page that, that has these sounds. Okay. Uh, so for planets, you can also use it and it's, it's, uh, it's even easier because they're closer by. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Oh, very nice one. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, actually it's, it's a question I wanted to ask and then I forgot about it. Because you talk about the light, but you analyze the light in different frequency ranges and, and then get different modes from different frequency ranges, or is it always the same? Uh, you can choose. Usually you, well, uh, it's an interesting question because what we get from the star is the light and you can look in the visual light, but you can also use a filter and look at just part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And depending on where you look, you might see the vibration stronger or less strong. And that's interesting. Already that gives us a lot of information. If you see more, if you see it stronger in, in the blue or in the red, that, that's interesting. So we, but the data that we used is just in one filter because already there you can identify what kind of vibration is it. But so you can look in different filters and you will get different information also on the vibrational content and you can learn a lot from that. It can help you to identify what are the ex ex exact movements of the stellar surface, actually. If you look at it in different filters, that can help you to determine yeah, how the star is deforming. And the star stays a dot of light, so it's quite amazing that from these just these measurements, you can reconstruct what it's doing in 3D. I just wanted to know because you were today all presenting also your approaches and I think there's quite some overlap, but is there any takeaway you would have from the fellow participants tonight, what was the exchange, so maybe I'll know tomorrow you're going to think more about stars or less, or is there any takeaway or cross fertilization, I don't know. Well, actually I'm quite interested in uh, yeah, the aspect of uh, that what would be not musical or what would be the elements uh, that you would not use um, for making the sonifications because I'm and I'm also interesting maybe interest would be interested in the, the kind of protocols that you use to make certain decisions and and then see why you would make these decisions and and what kind of other decision could be made then? Thank you. <laughs> um, well, I'm pretty amazed by what I saw, to the, saw tonight and heard tonight. Um, I might need a bit of time to decipher everything, uh, a night or two, but it sure brings me some ideas, of course, and um, I will follow up a little on the sound matters and, uh, of course, on the work of Arnold. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Yeah, and I, I have some questions for you both, actually. So for, for the installation with the, um, yeah, with, with the solar cycle, eh? so you, um, you show some, some flashes of light mm -hmm. that correspond to when you have more aurora. Mm -hmm. And we also saw different colors. Uh, how is that related? Um, so it's mainly blue. Mm -hmm. um, but when it's more intense, well, it's linked to the laser I'm using, uh, you have like white and, and blue. Mm -hmm. um, mechanically, it's a laser, a UV laser that goes through um, a special liquid, which is a UV reactive. So the stronger the laser, meaning the stronger like the KP index would be, um, it goes further in the liquid. Uh, so at the bottom it will be more whitish and on the top um, it would be more blue. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just mechanically linked to that. It's blue because of the, um, of the UV. Um, we learned that uh, you actually have polar auroras, blue polar auroras, uh, auroras on uh, other planets. Um, but here uh, on Earth, it's mainly well uh, greenish and red. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what made you decide to to look at the aurora precisely? Well, it was a trip to Quebec mm -hmm. uh, in 2017. Uh, it was it, it it's linked to the. Um, the work uh, I did during a residency in Quebec, uh, which was uh, homeostasy uh, electromagnetic, uh, where we used sound to express those variations. Um, so I, I thought it was an interesting matter and um, like a um, defi to, yeah, yeah. to, to start to reinterpret those data, yeah. which are sometimes very abstract. And um, I think it's a nice uh, way to like make uh, people become more interested in those data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And if I may, yeah, we showed you showed the, the heliophone. Eh? Mm -hmm. uh, how did you come up with this idea? Because it, uh, if I understood correctly, it follows the sun. So. Um, mm -hmm. And, and yeah, how does that work? And why did you start with the project? Um, yeah, it was mostly the continuation of the photophone when, mm -hmm. when I was working on the, on the laser lights. And I wanted really to have an installation that could be placed uh, on Earth and could make a relation to the sun. That was already something that was already longer uh, time in my mind. And because of the working on the photophone and the light, um, from this point of view, uh, I, I was yeah, it came to the heliophone to to work on that. But uh, the other question, yeah, it's based on databases. Mm -hmm. Of course, you place it uh, perfectly. You know where the uh, the north is, where the the, the south is, and then. Uh, once this installation is placed uh, according to shadows and, and so on, um, it, ru it runs through the databases. Yeah, yeah. yeah. because it's, once you know the exact position, you know the exact position of uh, the sun. Yeah. So, so it doesn't actually react directly to the position of the sun, but it, it knows from the database where should the sun be now. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It's, it, it's actually knowing where the sun is and it yeah. follows the sun from, uh, from the morning to the, to the evening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Nice. <laughs> uh, another question? Uh, this is a question for Catherine. Namely, um, so you listen to a stars using light, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the regular astronomers, your colleagues, always have listened to um, stars as well. And was wondering, yeah. Um, what um, if you see any relationships between the other EM spectra and the visual spectra? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So, so electromagnetic radiation is also it's uh, the the radio waves are also electromagnetic radiation. Most of the data that I are used are from visible light and maybe a bit towards the UV or the infrared. Um, 
in the radio, uh, it depends, but certain cosmic sources have their favorite region to emit in. And so you might have stronger radio signals from, um, from other phenomena than these pulsations of stars. So we use the electromagnetic radiation as a window to the universe. And depending on what um, frequency range you're in there, eh? so whether you're in the visual or whether you're in the infrared or whether you're in the, the UV or the X-rays or the gamma rays or the radio waves, you will see different things. Uh, just because you have mm, phenomena that are happening with certain energies that cause them to radiate mostly, for example, in the radio or in the in gamma rays. And that's why we, we do get a different window. So you would get uh, less, less data on these pulsations if you look in the radio. Uh, but you will get other data of maybe the surroundings uh, that are very useful. And just like with the sonification of the, of the light variations, Indeed, radio astronomers, they, are also, they also convert these, these signals into sound, and you can hear uh, a beep, for example, when, you, when something unexpected happens. Uh, so does that answer your question? Yes, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Um, and I have a, a, a second question also for Mathieu. Um, so your, your installation, if I understood correctly, is you try to give sense or listen or do something with the aurora borealis. I seem to remember that there is, there are def definitely testimonies, and there's also done some scientific research on people who could actually hear the aurora borealis um, physically, without any gizmos. Have you? Do you know anything about that? I have no idea about that. Um, and on my installation, uh, the the sound is is not uh, produced by, by the data. So I have a um, first frequency that is transformed with the data. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the, the sound is just uh, like a medium to uh, create and to divert the, um, uh, the lasers and that creates this kind of shape that look like uh, a very fast visualiz visualization of a uh, Noah. So yeah, no, but I, w I was looking into it. That's that's interesting. Some other questions? No? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, in this case, uh, we will finish in our laser toys, 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 toys. Panelists, Katrin, Arnaud, Mathieu, thank you very much for to take part uh, in and uh, also, also listening to uh, this uh, interesting, inspiring for me at least uh, um, talks. And uh, yeah, so just uh, also thank you to Imal to host us here. And uh, yeah, so just we'll keep you informed for the next one. And in all cases, uh, the, the after if you will have, uh, if you forget something or something just missing, you can go back and to listen it on internet. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye. Sorry for all the messages. No, no, it's okay. No, no, I hope I helped. But, <laughs> yes, you did. Uh, yeah, yes, wow. yes.